Association from and for Albania students in Syria. More than 300 students are part of it, and its main goal is to bring together Swiss Albanian students in Syria. By organizing multiple events a year, like this one tonight in collaboration with Ivy Plus, Studenti aims at establishing relationships and communication among Albanian students, but its doors are open, of course, also to Swiss students. As for Dialogue Plus, they are more recent. They started in 2014, and they are also an association whose main purpose is to build bridges between Albanian diaspora and the global population. And the, the main goal is to promote reciprocal acceptance exchanges at an economic, social, and cultural level. They publish regularly a cultural magazine with the same name. Now, let me introduce uh, briefly Professor uh, Laura Mersini Houghton. She is a theoretical physicist and cosmologist professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, she is a member of the theory group of uh, gravity, cosmology, and high energy physics, as well as the Institute of Field Physics. Now, she has a long career which started in the mid 90s from the uh, BA's uh, Bachelor of Science degree in the University of Tirana in Albania. Then she won a Fulbright scholarship to the University of Maryland, uh, Maryland in College Park, where she uh, finished her master of studies. Then she moved to Wisconsin in Milwaukee when she finished her PhD. And from that she had uh, two postdoc stays, first in Italy at the School of Normal Superior of Pisa, and another one in uh, Syracuse, University of Syracuse, New York. Then she was a visiting professor at uh, in Waterloo, Ontario, and then finally she landed in the University of uh, North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where she is currently a professor. Now, she has many research interests, but the three main themes of her research are mostly related to the question of dark energy, that of origin of universe and the fundamental nature of space and time, and also the relationship between physics of black holes and quantum physics. Now, based on these fundamental physics uh, promises, she has proposed the theory of the origin of the universe starting from quantum landscape multiverse. Now, this seems strange, but she will explain it. Now, there is even more, something sounding more technical, but it can be explained in more simple words. More recently, she has shown that the back reaction of Hawking radiation and the, when a gravitational collapsing star prevents the formation of a singularity at an event horizon, which makes the star bounce. In simple words, she is putting into doubt the existence of black holes. <laughs> okay. So, she has uh, authored or co authored uh, various books, among which Arrows of Time and Debate in Cosmology. And cosmic update dark puzzles out of the time and future history. She has been guest of many TV and radio shows like BBC Horizon Documentaries, BBC News 9, BBC 4 Radio Interview, and so on. National Geographic Discovery Science, Deutsche Welle, and, and so forth. She has written uh, popular papers for science magazines like New Scientist Cover Story or Discover, Scientific American, Cosmos, BBC Focus, Bitcoin Wissenschaft, as well as Focus Italy and France. The Republican Garden, Sunday Park, and so on. Now, the key question she has tried to address is she is well known for having, let's say, challenging some of the long accepted concepts like these, as I mentioned before, do black holes really exist? And her bold ideas have sometimes been noted with uh, skepticism. However, some of her predictions in collaboration with other scientists could be successfully tested recently in Planck and uh, Large Hadron Collider experiments. Therefore, they are increasingly gaining acceptance. So it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Laura Mersini Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this amazing institution and this beautiful uh, city, and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the origins of the universe today. Can you hear me? Okay. So today, I will talk about something which has uh, fascinated me sufficiently to spend a decade thinking about it and working on it, and that's the origin of the universe. You, you may have come across stories that general relativity, and of course Einstein is an alumna here, um, and quantum mechanics seem to be in conflict with one another. Quantum mechanics work extremely well at small scale, general relativity works extremely well at large scales, but because they seem to not agree with each other, when we get to cosmology, then eventually many scientists argue that we need a theory of quantum gravity. Now, why do these two theories come into play in cosmology? Because the universe is the best arena for testing both theories. The universe 
was small once upon a time, only 14.7 billion years ago. It's large now. When it was small, quantum mechanics must have been very important. Now that it's large, general relativity is important. Both gravity and quantum effects were extremely important at the universe's infancy. So we can't have two theories that make opposite predictions when we talk about a single system such as our baby universe. And that's why it is very important to try and understand how did our universe really start? Well, if you ask some of my colleagues um, in the deep south, they'll they have told me, go with the Bible. But there are other ways. James Asher, a very famous Anglican bishop, archbishop, Irish, spent a lot of his days reading all the Bibles and, and all the other holy books of various religions. He was a very erudite man so, and highly respected. So after all this study, he concluded in 1654 that the world was created at exactly 6 p.m. on 22nd of October, 4004 BC. And that's true. And many people, because he was so influential, many people took him seriously. But of course, we know things changed in the 19th and the 20th century. So by now we know the world didn't start in 4004 BC, not at 6 p.m. on October 22nd, speaking of which, what's the date again? 21st. Oh, okay, so that's a coincidence. Um, so by now we know, or at least I say we, we believe, because we have collected a lot of evidence, but. Uh, uh, most of it is indirect evidence in support of, of this idea we have of our model of cosmology. And that is, we believe that the universe started with cosmic inflation, Big Bang inflation. That happened at 10 to the minus 43 seconds. What does that mean? That means 10, uh, one part over 10 with 43 zeros behind it. So in, in a split fraction of a second, our universe came into being. It was tiny in something known as the Planck scale, which is related to Newton's constant, extremely small. And then through inflation, and I'll go into some detail on what inflation is about. Through inflation, it, it suddenly, in a fraction of a second, it became the size of a grapefruit. And then, briefly after that, at 10 to the minus 32 seconds, you have the first particles, quarks, appearing. At 10 to the minus 6 seconds, that's one of a millionth of a second, the universe has grown big enough so that the temperature has dropped. And in that way, these quarks can clump together and create protons and neutrons. So that, that's very early on in the history of the universe. At three minutes, something very interesting happens. The universe is still way too hot, so light and these protons and neutrons are mingled together into a primordial soup. That means even if we want to see the universe today, at its first three minutes, we can't because the only way we can see is by sending and receiving light signals. If light is trapped, then we can't see anything. But however, the, the first atoms are trying to form, the universe is still too hot, and then at 300 years, the universe has cooled down enough, it's big enough, that finally neutrons and protons can be the first atoms in the universe, and mainly hydrogen and uh, helium. And at one billion years, the universe is quite big, and under gravitational condensation, you see these clouds of hydrogen and helium start creating the first stars and galaxies, and so on. That number of uh, 300 years is a very important scale in cosmology. Why is that? Because at that point, light finally managed to separate from this primordial soup of quarks and protons and neutrons and, and even atoms. So that is the first time in the history of the universe when we can see things. How can we see those things now if they happened only 300 years after the universe uh, underwent cosmic inflation? Well, we, as I said, we only see by sending and receiving light. Light has a certain speed. So for light to travel from where I am to that wall, it will take a certain amount of time. When I look at the star far away, then 
I am seeing that star by the light it produced, suppose that star is, is a billion years away. I'm seeing that star by the light it produced a billion years away. In other words, seeing far away, you are seeing backward in time. Because that light signal took time to travel all the way and reach your eye. So by the time that light signal was produced, it was a long time ago before it reached you. And that's how we can see all the way back to the first 300,000 years of the existence of the universe. And that's quite something. Our universe is 14.7 billion years old. So we can see all the way back to almost its uh, baby stage. That's our cherished model of cosmology, known as the standard model of cosmology, or cosmic equation, or call it whatever you like. But it presents a huge problem. It doesn't tell us what gave that first energy here of inflation. We just say there was some energy that propelled the universe into an accelerated expansion. But where did that come from? We have no answer yet to that. And then, if you do some sort of uh, statistical argument, which Sir Roger Penrose did in, in the 70s, you discover that the chance of starting the universe in, in the manner I described is one part in 10 to the power 10 to the power 123. You, you can imagine all those many zeros. It means that the probability of starting a universe such as that is extremely small. That means our universe, or it implies, our universe had a very, very special beginning. And physicists really do not like the word special on, on any situation in physics. We try to understand how the universe came into being rather than just say, well, it, it is a special beginning. And, and that's the reason why, um, especially on the last decade, there is a lot of research and interest, deep interest, on, on this question. What gave that inflat on energy, the, the energy of cosmic inflation, and why did we have to start with that, if, if it's so special? Or is it really so special? I mean, normally the story I describe to you seems it's incredibly simple. You just have a tiny batch of space filled with energy, it blows up. The universe grows, temperature cools down, you, you have all these elementary particles combining and eventually giving you atoms, light separates from, from matter, we can see stuff. Under gravitational collapse, we get the first uh, stars and galaxies, and the rest of the story goes as, as we all know and understand it today. So let, let me go in a few more detail about this cosmic inflation thing in order to highlight why we love it so much, although we are aware that uh, it, it's, it seems to be one of the most unlikely ways to start the universe. And, and that's the story. You start with this tiny, tiny patch, which in a fraction of a second, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, grows in, into the size of a grapefruit. Uh, and that makes the universe un uniform, homogeneous, and nearly flat. That tiny patch contains that, that energy that we don't know where it comes from, and that energy shows up again at present day, but uh, I'll save that for later. But anyway, we don't know where the energy comes from, but if it's there, and if it's very high, then we get the, the story that I told you about uh, the evolution of our universe. And then the story goes that, of course, quantum mechanics should be valid at, at the time when the universe is this tiny patch. In quantum mechanics, fluctuations are always present. Uh, fluctuations in the fabric of space-time itself, in the fabric of the cosmos, as well as fluctuations of this inflationary field. So those wrinkles, those fluctuations in, in the space-time of, of that uh, initial universe are exactly what seeds later on the large-scale structure within the universe, that is galaxies, stars, planets, anything, dust, cosmic dust, anything else. And something else, which is important now, as the cosmic microwave background. Now, I can see most of the people in this room are way too young to remember the days when we didn't have digital cable, and you switch on the television, and if you couldn't catch a cable, <coughs> you'd get that buzz on, on the screen. That buzz is the cosmic microwave background. What you are recording is this field of radiation at extremely low temperatures that, that permeates, that, that fills the whole universe and is a relic left over from the time of the Big Bang. And that's why it's called microwave, because it, it's at the very low frequencies, very low temperatures. 
it is a very appealing story, a very natural story. You have some energy in a small patch, that patch blows up. As it blows up, it cools down. When it cools down, you get gravitational condensation and you populate that patch, that grown patch now, with stars and galaxies. The big question that even the one of the founding fathers of inflation, Alan Guth, here in this <coughs> picture, is what gave that energy and what was there before. So in Alan's work, inflation is that brief period of intensely accelerated expansion. It's a bit like the driving Omer was doing the night to get us here, <laughs> when we were nearly flying over the other cars. Uh, and, and that is driven by, by this uh, energy that we don't know where it comes from, but is there at, at the early universe. So that, that makes the universe, by blowing it up in all directions, very quickly, that makes the universe big and smooth. And it also does something else. It removes this region that became our universe from anything else in terms of causal contact. What does that mean, causal contact? Well, again, we communicate through uh, light signals. And, and that's how we determine, for example, the edge of our universe, the horizon of our universe. It is the place, the distance, where if you send a light signal, it is the last time that signal will come back to you. If you go any further, you'll never see that signal mm -hmm. back. So that, that is the boundary. What inflation does is remove, make that patch grow so big, create some sort of boundaries, if you like, and, and then um, remove it from contact with, with everything else, meaning that if you were to send a light signal, uh, these different regions will not communicate anymore with each other. You'll never see that signal back to you. What evidence do we have for inflation? Well, think of, of the volume of the universe as closed, a sphere, open, a saddle, flat, a plane. Of course, it has to be a three-dimensional plane. And, and uh, the geometry of the universe, to Einstein equations, is determined by the stuff you throw into the universe, the, the energy components in, of the universe. You can think of the universe as this box where you throw radiation, you throw matter, you throw energy, all of those contributions combined together will determine whether the universe is flat, open, or closed. We can see that. We can measure that. How? Through this triangle that you see drawn here. Of course, in, in a flat patch, the, the sum of the triangles should be to 180 degrees. Here it should be more, and here it should be less than 180 degrees. So how do we see that? And, and why is that? and evidence for inflation. Well, inflation says we should have a uniform homogeneous in that universe. So that last word, that means that if we were to draw a triangle in the sky, take three stars, for example, to make that triangle, that those triangles should add up to 180 degrees. We don't quite do that, we do something even better. Because nature gave us this perfect ruler, the cosmic microwave background. This field of photons, of radiation that fills the universe, and it's a relic from the Big Bang, but at present day, because the temperature has grown big, the temperature has cooled down, so this radiation is at the microwave uh, regime. It's, it's a very low energy radiation. But since it originates all the way from inflation time, then it has a characteristic size of 300 thousand light years. Why? Because if you remember when, when I showed the slide with the history of the universe, at 300,000 years, light separated from, it, from from the rest of the universe. So by measuring the temperature fluctuations, that's how we see the cosmic microwave background, we are pretty much looking at hot regions in the sky and cold regions in the sky, and the temperature map of the sky. So by, by looking at those, we know that they should have a characteristic size at, at this magic number, and by measuring their angular size, think of the triangle now, that would be the base of the triangle, their angular size would tell us whether we are looking at a flat universe, a sphere, or a saddle. And, and that's how we know our universe is flat. That measurement has been done by Colby WMAP and recently Planck satellite. That gives us hope that we are on the right track with this uh, standard model of cosmology on how the universe started and where it is now. But again, it doesn't answer that second and very fundamental part of the question. Where did that energy come from to start the universe? Why is our universe so special according to simple estimates like 
the panels one that I mentioned. Well, let, let's think about this. So here is our universe at the beginning. Filled with energy, but a tiny patch. Forget this other part for a moment. Just focus here. So we have a tiny patch filled with energy, which glows. The yellow region is the part where the universe is undergoing accelerated expansion. It's growing very fast. And then the temperature cools down. As it grows, it continues to grow, but it's not in an accelerated manner anymore. And, and light separates from matter, then galaxies form. And here we are today. After light has separated, after galaxies have formed, here we are at 14.7 billion years later. And we can see the cosmic microwave background in this sky today, and the galaxies, of course, and the large scale structure. You say, great. But first, if I want to ask where this initial point came from, so I buy the rest of the story. Once you start from here, I believe you for the rest of this. But where did that come from? And then you realize that the question doesn't make sense if you don't have an ensemble of pool of many possible ways to start the universe. What, what does it mean, oh, I've got a, a yellow card in, in my pocket, if all I have in my pocket is a yellow card? I mean, when I say, if I were to ask a question, do I have a yellow card in my pocket? Uh, do I have a yellow card in my pocket? Then that would imply that there are other colors by which I can compare the yellow and, and uh, ask that question in a meaningful way. So the same goes for, for the um, start of our universe. The very asking of the question, why did we start with this universe immediately implies as compared to what else? Otherwise, the question is meaningless. So as compared to what else takes us to this part of the picture, where you can have many possible places. Pictorially, this is what I'll explain later to be the landscape of string theory. But pictorially here, just think of this as a field of energies. Our universe is sitting at this point, so it's taking some energy which is the energy of, of our Big Bang, but then you, you can think that it could also sit here and take another energy. Then the question makes sense, that why is it sitting here instead of that, or that, or some other point? So that, that's the first part of the question, but that's, that, that has immediate implications, huge implications. That means we have to think of some sort of a multiverse, of, of an ensemble, of, of a pool of initial universes in order to even have the right to ask the question of the origin. The second part, then, of course, is, okay, fine. Just for the sake of the argument, let's say we do have this ensemble of initial states. Then what? Can we calculate where, which place in, in this landscape of energies will our universe choose? There, there are ways to do that. At the moment, that's a very active area of research, and there are at least three or four proposals. But up until recently, any time people talked about uh, what gave the, the energy of the Big Bang and what was there before, I mean, you, you think from, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, drawing turtles here at the dawn of time, turtles on top of turtles, or dinosaurs, or question marks. More recently, there was hope that some unknown theory of quantum gravity would help us, but this, this question is, has been very evasive and it was considered one of those very difficult questions that perhaps cannot be solved in a lifetime. Not so recently because of the uh, progress in both theoretical physics and, and observational uh, astronomy. So, to, to take this slowly now, before we jump into the multiverse, let, let's stick with what we know. Right now, the two pillars of modern physics remain general relativity and quantum physics. And general relativity is applied uh, for, it's useful for large distances, it fails at the microscopic level. Quantum mechanics does the reverse, it's useful for, for small uh, distances, microscopic distances, but if you want to apply this to the universe, or the universe was small, then it would, it's in disagreement with general relativity. If you have, if you are forced to make a choice, that it's either quantum mechanics or general relativity at, at the start of the universe. That choice will have very profound implications about the nature of the cosmos itself, the nature of reality. Why? General relativity is something where you calculate 
and you give an exact answer, provided you can do the calculation, you give an exact answer of what will happen to an object at a certain point in time, at a certain place. In contrast, quantum mechanics never gives you an exact answer because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. He tells you probabilities. It says, well, this particle has a 90% chance to be here, but it also has a 5% chance to be there, and a 2% chance to still be in the car trying to get here, and so on and on and on. So that's the uncertainty principle. You, you can never pinpoint, you, you talk in terms of probabilities, to add to top that up, in quantum mechanics, you always have fluctuations. So the, the fabric of space-time itself, at the fundamental level, will have these fluctuations, these, these ripples. General relativity. The Einstein's genius idea was to say, OK, gravitation, I can think of that as a curving of space-time. Think of this ball. It's got mass, and therefore energy, the famous E equal MC squared. So rather than the talking of the gravitational force of this ball as it tries to pull on this smaller ball, instead you can forget you have the blue ball there completely. And replace that, remove the ball, and replace that with this um, curved sheet of paper, of plastic. <laughs> Why? Because you have two choices according to Einstein, and he was right on on that. You can either Forget about space-time, the metric of space-time, and just think of a gravitational force between these two objects, or you can totally forget about gravity. It's not that. And instead, replace that with the curvature of space-time. The path along which the small ball will move, whether you think of it being pulled by the blue ball, or whether you think of it as being as following the shape of this curved space, the path will be the same. So you get the same effect. The path along which objects move is deflected due to curvature rather than due to gravity. And that was a genius idea that changed the world for good. Matter and energy tell space how to curve. <coughs> now think of that in the context of the universe. The universe, you are throwing it, it's your box, and you are throwing energy, matter, radiation, whatever you like to it. That will determine how the universe curves. That's why, you, by knowing what stuff you put in there, you can decide whether it's flat, closed, or open. In terms of uh, Einstein equations, which used to be a horror story for most physics students until recently, but that really just described in a mathematical way this simple statement, matter and energy tells space how to curve. The, the Einstein equations are this. G nu nu here is the Einstein tensor, tensor star matrices, which is a geometric object. This thing here tells us about the curvature of space, space time. On the right hand side, you have T nu nu, which is the tensor, this matrix that tells you about the energy content and the pressure content, the stresses. So Einstein's famous saying, matter and energy tell space how to curve can be mathematically written into the geometry of space-time, the curvature of space-time, is determined by the stress-energy content of it. It's great, it works wonderfully well, it's been tested to exquisite precision, you all know about LIGO last year. So what's wrong with it? Well, it breaks down at Planck energies. And remember, the universe starts at nearly Planck energies and Planck distances and Planck times. So it breaks down at exactly the place where we need it, at the place where our universe emerges into existence. It also breaks down at the center of a black hole, at the singularities. So in extreme situations of very high energies, this theory breaks down. The reason is simple, and, and it's something that the first year physics students learn on dimensional grounds. Whenever you have a theory that will have some constant number built into it from the beginning, then you know that whatever you calculate will depend on that constant number you put in your theory. So that means, your, in physics, we call that an effective theory. It, it tells you that constant number tells you the energy or the scale at which your theory will break down. In um, Einstein's case, that constant is inverse of the uh, Newton's constant. We were talking about gravity. And, and uh, that's Planck mass squared, and it, that's exactly the energy at which it breaks down. So no surprises there. 
And there have been so many efforts trying to modify gravity. It hasn't been very successful so far. Einstein's theory survives amazingly well, and it's very hard to, to change, to modify. <laughs> On the other hand, it cannot be extended beyond the regime into which it breaks down because of a famous theorem called the Van Damme uh, Zeltovich Weltman theorem that is related to the fact that gravity also has zero mass. Let's jump to quantum mechanics now, the other theorem. So the essence of quantum mechanics is that we talk of waves. We don't talk of pinpoint particles of objects with very sharp contours. We talk of them as a bundle of waves. But waves have infinite size. So that gives the wrong impression of what Bohr holds Spooky action does at a distance. Because if all the waves are, are spread all the way to infinity, then of course it seems like they are talking to each other even if they are separated by distances far, uh, further than the speed of light communication. The other problem is that due to the uncertainty principle, precision or determinism about the <coughs> is gone, it's disappeared. Wave packets have so many waves in them, when you ask a question about the position or the velocity or whatnot of, of that particular wave, you will be given an answer in terms of probabilities. So that means, according to quantum mechanics, nature is indeterministic at its fundamental level. And that's an ongoing discussion among the best minds in physics, is nature deterministic or not? Nobody knows yet. But if you believe quantum mechanics is the final truth, then all the predictions made from this theory are based on probabilities. If you try to apply this to the universe, it, it makes some very disturbing statements. For example, this bottle of water, I can think of it quantum mechanically, as a bundle, uh, a bundle of waves, a wave packet made up of uh, many waves in it. How? If you are in a concert, in a symphonic concert, you'll have many instruments producing many various harmonics. All you hear is not the individual harmonics or the individual instruments, you hear the bundle, the, the wave packet that reaches your ear. If you apply that to the universe, one way would correspond to the geometry of a particular space-time, another way would correspond to the geometry of another space-time. So what does it mean to have a wave packet in terms of the fabric of space-time? What does it mean to have so many geometries all bundled together? It's not clear. Okay. So does that mean that quantum mechanics is a game of chance? Yes, and it gets even worse. Not only does it, mean, does it seem that way, since we talk in terms of probabilities, but it also has an associated problem related to the need for an observer. And that goes all the way back to Niels Bohr and the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, but it basically says, if you want to make a statement that one of the waves in this bundle of waves uh, happen to be with 50% probability at that wall, then somebody must be watching. And, and when you are watching that particular wave, then that becomes a classical particle. So going from a quantum wave to a classical particle, you need an observer. And of course, nature didn't come with a manual. So we don't know what, the, what makes that the best observer or whether that's a fundamental issue that we need to solve or not. But, but we do know that at least at this level of our understanding of quantum mechanics, that observer will take a quantum particle and convert it into a classical particle. The universe we see around us today is classical, so we, we know that that quantum to classical transition did happen. Anyway, according to quantum mechanics, everything fluctuates. Particles, fields, this empty room, the fabric of space-time itself, particles pop in and out of existence. Some appear, some disappear. They come in pairs of particle and antiparticles, so you still conserve energy and momentum. But they can spontaneously pop in and out of existence. And there should be an energy of the vacuum. And it should be huge. But if the fabric of space-time itself is filled with energy, the universe should have collapsed a long time ago. It should have crushed. And we know, by, by that argument alone, that um, the vacuum energy is either zero, the energy contained in empty space-time is either zero or is extremely small. How do we know that? Well, here is another example. 
I mean, we, we know that the universe has no crumbs, but uh, if empty space-time contains vacuum, energy, and lots of it, then if I throw this, and space-time was filled with this vacuum, that shock should bounce back at me. It's like hitting a brick wall and bouncing straight back. The fact that it didn't bounce back at me means that uh, there isn't much there. It just hit empty and went straight to the ground. So all these problems we don't understand, we don't know why vacuum energy is small. So who the vacuum energy should be small? For, for all we know, it should be huge. Or that it should be zero. So all of those seem to point to the need for a deeper explanation. Perhaps quantum gravity? Or perhaps something else? At present, we have these two extremely successful theories, both tested to exquisite precision, and yet they can't help but they are irreconcilable when it comes to the early universe, to the emergence of the universe. And things get worse, get a lot worse in fact. The universe right now contains a type of energy which is identical to the energy of cosmic inflation, to the energy of Big Bang inflation. Fortunately for us, it is at much smaller scale, but its nature is exactly the same. We call the energy at present dark energy. How do we know that that energy is there? Because of the supernova team, by now there are many experiments, but the supernova team were the first ones to see that the universe is accelerating again. It's not just growing at a steady rate, but it's actually uh, growing in, in an accelerated manner. So then immediately we know from Einstein equation, remember Jimmy Lee put Timmy Lee? That tells us immediately the universe must have some vacuum energy to make it accelerate. We don't understand what the energy of inflation is, so of course we have absolutely no clue what this dark energy at present is. That means we have no idea what will happen to the universe in the future. And then there is another problem, and that is the problem of the era of time. Now, the problem of time is probably much more difficult than the problem of the origin of the universe itself. It's one of these topics that has occupied philosophers and scientists since Aristotle to present time. It's even mentioned in St. Augustine's Confessions when he says, if anyone asks me what time is, of course I know. If they ask me to explain it, I know not. So everybody has a good sense of what time is. You better than anybody else in the world, because we saw watches are famous for measuring time. But if I ask anyone to explain to me, what is time? What is the nature of time? Nobody knows. And then we also know the story of our universe was small, it grew big, and it continues to grow. So not only do we not understand the nature of time, but we don't even understand why is there an error of time. Immediately we know there is an error by simple observation. Small yesterday, big tomorrow. So something changed to tell me yesterday was past, tomorrow is future. I can tell the difference between the two just by looking at the size of the universe. Even better, I can tell the difference between past and future just by looking in the mirror. We go from cradle to grave. We don't go the other way around. So clearly there is a big difference between past and future. We don't understand why that is or what causes it. And that's a very difficult problem because all the laws of physics we know are time symmetric. Take Maxwell's equations, electromagnetic, or Einstein's equations, or quantum mechanics. You can always put time to minus time, in other words, you change past and future, you swap that, you still get a solution to that equation. So theories that we cherish, love, and trust, that are supposed to describe our universe, do not have an era of time built into that. Then how can these theories describe our universe when we know for sure our universe has an era of time? And ultimately, if you think a little bit more about this, the era of time, which in thermodynamics is determined by the entropy growth, entropy measures disorder. So, in this room, for example, if I had arranged all the air in the room, I had an amazing vacuum machine. So I pulled all the air out of this room and collected it all in a corner. That's a very special arrangement. So it, it is very low disorder. It's special. Disorder is the opposite of special. 
that is very low entropy. If I let go, of course, all those air molecules will try to reach equilibrium, they will spread around this room and, and fill it uniformly, so I have grown disorder, I have grown um, entropy. And, and that's what the second law of thermodynamics is about. But if you live in a static universe, so it doesn't go. You can't tell an error of time just by observing the universe. You can always go and resort to the second law of thermodynamics that says entropy grows. And that direction of the growth of entropy will give you an error of time. If that is true, it means that the problem of the origin of the universe is actually identical to the problem of the era of time. Why? I told you the, about the Penrose calculation, showing that our universe started in an incredibly special way. But special means low disorder, low entropy. So I can restate the fact that our universe had very, a very special start into saying our universe started at extremely low entropies and now it, is, it stands at higher entropies. And entropy grew, and that gives me an error of time. Why did our universe start at low entropies? We don't know. So we, we can restate the problem of the origin into a uh, problem of the error of time. OK. What do we at least know? Well, observationally, observationally, we can go and measure things today in the sky, and we know the following, and we know this for sure. All of us, baryons, stars, galaxies, baryons are protons, neutrons, normal matter. We only make up 5% of the total energy density of the universe. That's all. Anything we see in the sky, put it all together, that's only 5%. 25% of it is matter again, but it's dark. Dark meaning that we don't have much of a light signal communication or exchange with it, so we can't see it, it looks dark to us. However, since it's matter, it's something we understand, we're used to that, we understand particles. So, this disturbs us in, in the sense that we haven't seen it yet, what type of dark matter the universe is filled up with, and that's disturbing because there are so many experiments trying to, to figure out what kind of matter or particle that is, but conceptually it's not disturbing at all because we understand matter. So we, we can come up with many models of matter, including dark matter. And there are many such models. The most bothersome is this part here, dark energy, vacuum energy. That same type of energy that cosmic inflation had at the beginning that made the universe emerge. We didn't understand it then, we don't understand it now. And we have no familiar grounds on which to try and put some intuition or, or, or get help from because we've never come across vacuum energy in, in our experience. So we are really in the dark here. We have no idea what, uh, what dark energy is. There are maybe a billion models, but that's an exaggeration. There are about 5,000 models, but nobody knows what, what uh, really dark energy is. By observation, supernova and, and many other kind of satellites and so on, we know that, that dark energy makes up 70% of, of the total energy budget of the universe right now. That has a strange property, that energy. As the universe grows, think of a bunch of particles that you put in a balloon. You can't change the number of particles. So that's the matter. Particles are matter. If, if you grow the balloon so it becomes bigger, then of course the density of these particles is diluted. It goes down because you made the volume bit, but, but still have the same number of particles. So as the universe grows, matter, whether it's dark or ordinary, diet goes down. But this energy, this dark energy or vacuum energy, does not. It stays a constant. In fact, it used to go under the name that Einstein gave it, the cosmological constant. So if the universe grows and the energy density of this weird type stays a constant, it means that that energy is growing in time. If I keep the density in this cell a constant, and then I double the cell, of course I've doubled the energy. I have two such amounts now, and so on. So that means that energy will dominate in the future. Our universe, in fact, will be ruled by it, and that's the reason why we can't predict the future, the destiny of the universe. A, a brief history to this dark energy. 
Einstein really wanted an eternally static universe. Why? Because he really disliked talk of initial conditions, of something special that happened at a particular moment in time, that, that if you think of a universe that was small and then grew, of course it started from some point. So to, to avoid any talk of specialness for the universe, that's the reason Einstein wanted a static universe. It was always that. So we didn't have to worry about what gave it. And to do that, from his equations, he had decreased vacuum energy or dark energy lambda in, into his equations. <laughs> of course, if you add that, you don't get a static universe, it's soon found out. And meanwhile, Hubble in 1929 discovered that the universe is expanding anyhow, so don't try to get a static universe. And at that point, of course, Einstein agreed with Hubble. But he considered this vacuum energy the biggest number of his life, because really we've never come across such a species in, in our daily familiar surroundings, whether it's on Earth or in stars or, or in the CMB sky. And then in 1998 was the first time when my pure observation, observationalist had theories. The supernova team discovered that, like it or not, the universe is accelerating, so you have to explain what, what uh, is making it accelerate. It's really one, one of the most difficult questions in, in physics, and I think part of it is because we have no intuition since it's not an, a familiar object. And, and you, you can come up with a bunch of questions revolving around lambda. Is it a, a pure constant that like Einstein envisioned it? Or is it some sort of particle or quantum field that is dynamic? So it looks like a constant now, but it was not really a constant. And then, is it really that? Or are, are we looking at, at some modification of Einstein's theory of uh, gravitation? Nobody knows the answer to any of this. People are trying everything they can think of. Okay, so I, I just told you that 95% of the universe is dark. And we really, really understand 5% of it. The ionic matter. But how do we see the dark stuff? If it's dark, we can't exchange light signals with it. Well, through its gravitational field. If you have a concentration, a lump of matter or energy, of course there is a gravitational field associated with it. And that will make any, if you shine light to that lump, concentrated lump of matter, then of course due to the gravitational field, light will bound. Uh, it will go around, it will deflect. By measuring the deflection, you can indirectly measure of how big that mass of matter or energy should be in order to give you such a big reflection. And that's how we measure the dark stuff in, in the universe, by, by measuring the, the right reflection. It goes under the name gravitational lensing, because really that, that lump of matter or energy acts like lens. Okay. <laughs> so, so far, so far, I have told you of the eternally static universe that Einstein wanted, the blue, the distance between the blue lines, think of it as, as the size of the universe. So you can see it doesn't change with time, time is running vertically off. So that, that would be an example of an eternally static space-time. And it's a finite universe. If we did not have dark energy. If that supernova team did not tell us in 98 that the universe is accelerating, then we, we know that our universe started from this tiny patch, it grew because of cosmic inflation, but then it sailed down. It, it didn't go into an accelerated expansion forever. It went into a smooth, nice expansion that was not accelerated. And then, if you want to guess what happens in the future, well, we can Continue without dark energy, that is, we can continue doing that forever. Just expand at a steady rate forever. Or, depending on some strange phenomena happening, and if it, too much energy and matter is stuffed into the universe, then uh, it would collapse. So that, that would be an infinite universe. The universe we have right now is more likely this one. It started with Big Bang cosmic inflation, it grew very quickly. Then it slowed down, then it exited inflation, basically. But now it's accelerating again because of this dark energy at present. 
And since we don't know whether that dark energy is a pure constant, or is some particle that is behaving like a constant now, but in the future it can change behavior. It can slow down, it can speed up, who knows? Because of that, all we know is up to this orange line. We know right now we are accelerating. That tells us that pretty soon we'll empty out everything, all the matter will dilute and radiation, and the only thing left will be this dark energy. But since we don't understand dark energy, anything can happen. The universe can collapse into the future, it can grow at a steady rate, or it can do even something more drastic, which is literally be shredded apart. It, it can grow so fast that the, the fabric of space-time itself will undergo a big, uh, a big shredding. And that's disturbing that physicists cannot um, anticipate make predictions of what the future holds. <laughs> and that's why many people are excited about string theory. At the moment, this is the leading candidate for that theory of quantum gravity. At ETH, you have some great top world leading string theorists. So I'll keep this very short, since many of you have the experts here. But what does string theory say? It, it makes a grand declaration. Nature is 11 dimensional, 10 space plus 1 time. Particles are not pinpoint particles, but if, if you really had an exquisite microscope, you'd see that they are loops of strings. And you can think of universes, three space plus one dimensional universe, as a surface. That, that's a, a four dimensional surface separated by this extra dimension, since the total number of dimensions is 11. So you can think of universes as membranes, brains, that are orthogonal to, uh, to the extra dimensions. And of course, the first thing that comes to mind is, why would anyone think that? Why would physicists be so crazy as to go ahead and invent another seven dimensions? And, and the answer is very simple. It's because we really need to reconcile general relativity with quantum mechanics, and string theory is very successful along those efforts. One of them tells us the present universe, the other one uh, underlies uh, the theory of elementary particles, so when we try to understand the universe, we need both theories. There's a famous picture of uh, Heisenberg and uh, Niels Bohr discussing quantum mechanics. So, how can string theory help us in this case? Well, in 2002, after much complicated, gigantic effort by many <coughs> mathematicians and string theories, um, while trying to curl up the extra dimension, so the game you play is the following. You say, okay, I, I start with 11 dimensions, but I can only see four, three space plus one time, so I've got to do something about the extra seven. So how, how do I get rid of them? One way to get rid of them is to make them really tiny. Let the three space dimensions be large, but make the other seven tiny, curl them up, so that they are invisible to us. Therefore, we think the world is four-dimensional, but in fact it's 11-dimensional. That curling up is called the compactification. And, and there have been thousands of people working on, on compactifications, and in around 2000 to 2003, they discovered that if you start from 11 dimensions and reduce to four, you don't find just one universe, our universe, our four-dimensional universe, but you, you find lots of them that look like ours, four-dimensional worlds. In fact, the number so far is about 10 to the power 500 possible for dimensional world that you can get from this compactification. And of course, the big question is uh, then how, which one of these is our universe? How is our universe selected from this vastness? <coughs> that was coined by Dennis Hirsch in the landscape of string theory. And as you can think of this uh, lattice of vacuum of string theory that contains the energies in which from which the universe can start in motion, you, you can think of that as an energy flow. That, that's the easiest way to think of the landscape. This sounds strange. In fact, it was considered a crisis in around 2002, 2003, because the hope had always been that after the gigantic effort of quantification, he wanted to predict the universe like ours and be done with it. And you were, you predicted 10 to the power 500 of them. So initially it was considered uh, a crisis. It seemed that the theory might uh, become unfalsifiable. If you predict anything you measure today in the sky, you can always go and find a match in that landscape 
for, for that prediction. So if a theory cannot be falsified, then it's hard to take it uh, seriously as a scientific theory. However, that, that was false alarm because, and as I tried to convince you at the beginning, you can't even ask the question of the origin of our universe without having a pool of many possible universes to start from. So perhaps we needed, a leading candidate of quantum gravity needed to produce that kind of structure, that landscape of many possible initial universes, many possible beginnings. <coughs> and when you think about it, it's not new, and it's never been by choice. Think of you ever, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. PhD student of John Wheeler. John Wheeler was terrified, bored, disagreed vehemently with him to the very end. He dropped out of physics after his PhD, ended up dying at the age of 50, a drunk, and so on and on and on. Absolute genius. And his thesis that Wheeler shortened to 20 pages, but then later on, a colleague of mine from Chapel Hill, Bryce DeWitt, actually published a whole full thesis of 120 pages. That thesis is now known as the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it's very easy to understand. Hugh Everett insisted, we solve the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics. It's a differential equation. You don't find one solution, you find a family of solutions. If that Schrodinger equation you are solving is for the wave function of the universe, then those solutions are all these waves, if you like, in the bundle, or all these branches of the wave function of the universe. And from that point on, he departed from, from the orthodox wisdom of the Copenhagen inter interpretation by saying, since all of them are found mathematically, they all have an equal chance to exist. But each one of those produces a universe. And that is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. In other words, starting from a single Schrodinger equation, uh, you end up with, with a very profound implication, which is, Quantum mechanics, when applied to the universe, it predicts many worlds, not just one, but it predicts a whole uh, multiverse. Sometimes it's known as the Everett interpretation, sometimes as the many worlds interpretation. So that, that was 54 years ago, and it took 50 years for Everett to, to really get the full credit. Unfortunately, he's dead now, but by now, every theoretical physicist knows that I'm thinking and talks about the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's taken quite seriously. Another uh, candidate that provides a multiverse is inflation. We, we love inflation for our universe. We all believe our universe, banged into a cosmic inflation, grew quickly, and here we are today. The theory goes, the theory goes that um, if um, if it happened once, it can happen again. And that theory is advocated by Andre Lide and Alan Wood, the founding fathers of inflation. They said it is spontaneously, it's our own inflation started our universe. Why? And, and you have eternity to wait for this to happen again. Of course, it will happen again and again and again. So that goes under the name of eternal inflation. In short, even theories that, that we had no intention of exploring in terms of the multiverse ended up predicting the multiverse. So string theory is not alone in ending up with the landscape. It goes all the way back to quantum mechanics. And if you think about it, it's really an extension of the Copernican principle to the whole universe. If we are part of a multiverse, we are simply saying there's nothing special about our universe. We are just a tiny member in some corner of this vast, wonderful, uh, very complex cosmos. So there's nothing special about us. Pictorially, here is one picture of eternal inflation. One of those is our universe, is one of these bubbles. And if inflation keeps happening spontaneously, you make many such bubbles, and they can collide with one another. Another effort has been the anthropic selection. But that was very popular at the beginning. It's gaining less and less uh, popularity recently. Um, and yet another effort is something I've been working on since 2004, the theory of uh, uh, emergence of the universe from a quantum multiverse. And, and the idea there is, is, uh, is really simple. Think of Everett. 
the landscape can be your field of energies, if you like, in physics, it will be like potential energy, and then you allow the wave function of the universe to propagate, to go through this landscape. So, find the solutions to this wave function of the universe by using something like the Schrodinger equation. In this case, in quantum cosmology, is known as the wheeler dewitt equation. And, and, of course, that solution will tell you what the probability is for each of, of those branches of the wave functions and where in the landscape will they sit. You find a whole family of solutions, just like ever I did, because you are dealing with the differential equation, but many branches will sit at different places, different vacua on that landscape, in other words, at different energy sites. Meanwhile, quantum fluctuations are always present since we are solving this problem quantum as a quantum problem. So what happens is quantum fluctuations behave like matter, like part particles, and they are trying. You have these tiny patches, these branches of the wave function, sitting on some energy side, taking the energy of that side, which we know will make that tiny patch grow, undergo cosmic inflation, and produce a universe. But meanwhile, you have all these quantum fluctuations that are trying to stop that growth, that are back reacting on that growth. If you have very shallow energies, then the energy might not be enough to propel that universe, that tiny batch, into a fully blown universe. But if some branch is sitting at very deep backward, at high energies, then fluctuations might dent the growth a little bit, but they won't be sufficient to stop this accelerated growth of the universe. So this tug of war between gravity and the matter degrees of freedom provides a dynamic selection on what branch gives a universe and what branch doesn't on, on that landscape localization. It's a, it's a tug of war between gravity. So it, it gives a satisfactory answer. It says you have to start at high energies. It's the only way to produce a universe. Is if you end up localizing in some high energy site of that landscape. But does it do anything, any predictions that can be tested? Now, I borrowed this from uh, an article that the Italian Focus magazine wrote about this theory, but they have, from all written, they have the best graphics. So the, the yellow field is, you can think of that as the landscape, as that energy field, and, and the bubbles are these branches, quantum waves, that are about to become, to produce space time, to become universes to undergo inflation. And how can we get predictions that, that can test the theory? Well, here is one branch that localized on some deep energy, so it managed to, to have a universe, a space-time emerge out of it, to undergo inflation. And here is another one. These tiny things, they set in very shallow energies, very shallow back, yeah? so they never go into universes. But from all the surviving branches, the ones that managed to grow, meaning all the ones that have very high energies, uh, there is something in, in quantum that comes, that is the price you pay in studying the problem quantum mechanically, and that is uh, now this quantum entanglement, it's a crosstalk between all these different branches. And, and that can be calculated since we have a theory, we can find solutions to all these branches and how they crosstalk to one another and propagate that forward in time to present day from that landscape era to present day, you can make predictions on how that quantum entanglement leaves signatures, imprints, modifications in our sky at present. And we did that, and uh, we said, oh, here is another representation of, of a tiny branch that grew into a universe. We, we did that, and uh, we predicted there should be an area about a billion lights away of about uh, 200 megaparsec or 10 degrees in the sky, which would be completely empty. We called that the giant void, and it was seen about eight months later as the cold spot in cosmic microwave background. Uh, and there is a power asymmetry. There is slightly more matter. In, if you divide the sky into the northern and southern hemisphere, there is slightly more matter in the northern than in the southern. So all of those uh, predictions seem to be in complete agreement with the Planck satellite data now. And there are many other predictions that I won't go into details. But, do I believe it in it? Well, I like it for obvious reasons. Uh, we still need more data, all of this is evidence. We, it's not confirmation, so we, we need a four or five sigma effect to really believe that there is some truth 
to this theory as an explanation to the origin of the universe. Still warning, though, that, that all the predictions made so far seem to be in agreement with the anomalies that are observed in data. But this is the gist. If, uh, if any of you were ever in, in some uh, island all alone, take that list with you and try to figure out what's dark energy and therefore what's the ultimate destiny of the universe and uh, why is there a hierarchy of forces and energies? That's another problem that I didn't talk about. But then, of course, that's, uh, that's the pleasure of doing science and, and of being human for that matter, not just doing science, is that childlike curiosity in trying to understand the world around us. And in a slide, that's the progress in cosmology. We started from, you know, in, in the caveman era, charmants uh, and whatever superstitions we had in helping us understand the world. And, and now we are really at a stage where we can't just talk of crazy ideas, talk of these fancy ideas that remain in the realm of theory, but, but uh, technology is prepared so far that we have data in our lifetime to test these theories. And, that is what makes it exciting, and I, I'm sorry I am one minute over time, <laughs> but considering that it is 10, let me just end this, and let's see if we can make this work, because nobody can say it better than me. Saying that you don't understand it, meaning I don't believe it, it's too crazy, it's the kind of thing I just, I'm not going to look at. Uh, oh. The other possible, well, this kind, I hope you'll come along with me, and you'll have to accept it. Because it's the way nature works. If you want to know the way nature works, we looked at it carefully, look at it, that's the way it looks. You don't like it? Go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in the universe, where the rules are simpler. <laughs> Philosophically more pleasing, more psychologically easy. I can't help it, okay? If I'm going to tell you honestly what the world looks like to, to the to human beings who have struggled as hard as they can to understand it, I can only tell you what it looks like, and I cannot make it anything. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to simplify it. Eh? I'm not going to fake it. I'm not going to make it tell you something like a ball bear and it's on the So I'm going to tell you what it really is like. And if you don't like it, that's too bad, okay? I hope this interesting talk will also trigger some interesting questions. So please be courageous and ask tough questions. Okay. I have a question which is somehow related to mathematics. Uh, it just came up to me right now. Uh, so you know that Paul Rogers, this famous mathematician, who was also a friend of Einstein at some point, uh, he proved that not, not all statements within a given theory can be proved using all the, you know, the state, I mean, the, the axioms of the, the theory. theory yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that any of those statements that you're trying to understand could be one of those statements that can be proved within the given theory? Uh, no, that, that's a great question, but uh, no, that will become a problem if you look at the ultimate uh, nature of reality. I mean, uh, even if we make progress with the multiverse, even if there is such thing as a multiverse, because still you, you have a non, not negligible fraction of the community that does not like the idea. But, but even if we all love it and we make progress and we agree that that helps us understand our universe, um, you still have just scratched the surface. I haven't talked about laws. What gave the laws of physics? Where did those come from? And what about the mathematics itself? So you, you are building a kind of hierarchy of nature that, okay, here's the tiny universe and it's part of this fabric of the multiverse of space, time, or not. Are laws in a realm of their own, or are they part of the multiverse? If they are part of the multiverse, and if math is part of the multiverse, then you might run in trouble with the incompleteness theorem and, and with the kind of Turing argument that the machine will crash on itself. And, and count out for that matter. Other questions?
Beautiful. You've repeatedly said that the universe is expanding, right? But what exactly into is it expanding to? Ah, good question. So, that's another good, good reason to talk about what's beyond the horizon of our universe, beyond the edge of, of uh, our universe. So, in, in this case, I mean that the universe produced by inflation is a lot larger than than what we see, which is what's contained within our uh, horizon. Um, so yes, there is a space-time beyond the edge of our universe, and, and that's what we are expanding into. That, that would be the, the kind of short answer, but then if you were to repeat that question for all those other branches of the wave function, then, then it becomes a bit more complicated. Because if, if they go and produce their own universes, there are those growing in the same space time. Are all of them embedded in the same space time? Or are they living in some disconnected space time, each of them producing its own? So that, that's why it gets murky. So there is another question here, if I'm right. Yes. At some point, uh, you showed us the pictures, the sphere and the yeah. negative curvature and flat space. Then you said that. The, the satellite, Planck satellite, I guess, uh, gave evidence that the universe is and flat. And many before. And, and many experiments before yes, that. Yes, and yes, this in particular, and that the universe is flat, right? Mm -hmm. And then later on, uh, you showed in the picture that uh, space time is curved. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not flat. Where, right. Which picture? Yeah, where the world sits in the in the in the plastic, you said, right? Where the, I mean the bubbles, you mean? The eternal inflation? No, I mean where the mass curves the space. Oh, yeah, 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 right? yeah. Well, that's that's a bit of a contradiction. No, 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 because the word curvature is used for all three types of geometries, whether it's flat, open, or closed. We are still talking of some curvature. So for the flat one, we'd say there is a curvature, of course, but it's zero. And, and that's determined by the energy content. If you put a little bit more, you close the minimus, you put too much. If you put just a bit less, then it's a zero point. It doesn't manage to become flat. If you put just the right amount, meaning the energy density is a critical one, then you get our type of universe. Yeah. A question on this side? We have time for one or two short questions. Hello, uh, my name is Roy. I'm from the University of Shanghai. It's an economic university. And uh, it was very interesting to see your presentation. But for me, it was more like a script from a Star Wars film, another Star Wars film. <laughs> but, um, I want to ask more personal question. What was your motivation? I'm sorry. What was your motivation to study in this field? Right. If you think this looks like the Star Wars, wait, what happens to economics when trumpets? <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody hear the question? Uh -huh. yeah, okay. yes. So the motivation is was trying to understand the origin of This the was more of a personal question than saying, but it's welcome. Inspiring us, that starts to hear the motivation. So after economics, you start studying. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah, other questions? May I ask one here? Meanwhile? No. Yeah. I mean, they, they should need to warm up. They need to warm up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so my question is more practical, let's say, in a sense. Uh, when you say dark energy and dark uh, matter, yes. if they are both dark, how do you distinguish how much is one and how much is the other? Because they are conceptually, I mean, their nature is completely different. Dark when you give the number 20 no, something no, no, percent. No, it, it's a question. Uh, dark matter is matter. So you have the physical pressure that matter is, which is zero, mm -hmm. in the way. Dark energy is pure vacuum energy. Mm -hmm. At least at the epoch we can see it, mm -hmm. and we need to get the dark energy. So the pressure of, the, of vacuum energy is the negative of the energy density. So experimentally, how do you distinguish the two? Uh, well, like experimentally, the proof is I here. Mean, experimentally. Are, yeah, but uh, experimentally, the proof is here. We are here, right? 
Mm -hmm. Why did why the, the universe grow? Well, I agree with that. The fact that we are here is a bit of an anthropic uh, argument. No, 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 no. My, my point is another one. How no, you, you, you missed the point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reason we are here is because our universe only had energy and it grew, it accelerated. That tells you you have negative pressure. In, in, in Colloquia, you call that anti. Gravity. I agree with I mean, gravity you. Gravity makes this point, right? Not blow up. Right here. What I'm saying is something else. When you give numbers, where do these numbers come from? Oh, the, the numbers. Because when you say it's fine, yeah. it's in a sense, uh, how to say, the quantitative argument, but quantitative. Well, uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. And, uh, this is my question. Okay. I, I thought you were asking why is. Uh, no, 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 no. This is. Here it is. Okay. So um, the, the short answer is Einstein equations. Mm -hmm. They tell me that. The Hubble parameter, in other words, the expansion of the universe is zero by the energy density content of the universe. Okay. The second equation will tell you that the curvature of space depends on this combination of pressure and energy density of all the stuff you put in. So you go and measure. For example, supernova team measure. Supernovas are nothing special about them. They are just very bright stars, so we can use them as candles. And, and supernova team just observe how two supernovas, how fast they are moving away from another. So they directly, directly measure the accelerated expansion of the universe. And this depends on the with supernovas proportion come. between dark matter and dark energy? Uh, no, so you have, uh, in cosmology, you have six parameters besides the dark matter, dark energy, curvature, um, you also have things like the neutrino number and, and uh, <laughs> two other uh, parameters. But you need the same number of equations to make the symbol for everybody as the number of the unknowns. So you have the Einstein equations, and then um, you, you have this direct measurement by, by the supernova, and you are trying to break the degeneracy so you can measure each one of them in time. Nice if all you use is one equation, and that equation, say, I don't know, the geometry of the universe is determined by everything, then of course you can't tell what the individual components are, you just see the net total. But if you have other equations and other measurements, you can break the effect by measuring the pressure. Mm -hmm. Because the pressure is different. It's the equation of state. Thanks. Uh, is there any other? OK, there is another one here. Thank you. Um, at the beginning, you said um, you, you were talking about the metaverse and how the different, or how the universe came to be from the metaverse. And you talked about um, before the Big Bang was this and this and this. Um, but as I understand it, the concept of time Brilliant question, came yeah. into being um, at the start of the universe. So how can we talk about before time? Mm -hmm. No, that, that's a really good question. So that was my caveat of saying we really, really do not understand the nature of time. Translation of that is we don't know if time is a fundamental parameter of nature or whether it's an emergent phenomena. If it is an emergent phenomena, if time emerged only at the Big Bang of our local universe, then the question what was there before is forbidden because the word before cannot be used outside the context of time. There is no such thing as before. So then we say, okay, we have done all the physics we can. We can go as far as is possible with our, the understanding of the universe. Let's go home. That's one way of looking at it. Or you can say, well, I don't know whether time is emergent or fundamental. If it were fundamental, and, and in, in, in quantum theories, uh, time is always a built-in parameter. I mean, Schrodinger equation relates time to energy of the system. So implicitly, there you are assumed you do have such a thing as a time parameter. So if time is fundamental, then you have the right to ask the before the bank and after the bank. At least you can explore, you can ask a question, and then how much progress you make after that. Depends how good the, the tools are. But there's mathematical or observation of that. Uh, but at least you do have the right watch. So the price you pay for that is to postulate that time is a fundamental parameter. That does not mean that the error of time is fundamental. The error of time is a different form, it's two, two different questions. You, you can never know where our time, but the fact that you, something happens to the universe, it goes to a bank, that way the time symmetry. So you can still get the error of time local, you are just having the time parameter, some fundamental parameter. <coughs> so 
Uh, there is a thanks. There is a final question here. Is that correct? Well, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. Um, I'm not. A, I didn't study physics or astrophysics. I also studied economics. But my question is: You mentioned lambda. Um, can you say that's the point where you start to intersect with religion? And can you say that's the point where you start to uh, intersect with religion? And uh, do you have a personal opinion of what exactly is lambda? Uh, if I see that, uh, that has something to do with religion, this is the main question. <laughs> uh, it has nothing to do with religion. I, I, know seen, that, I know that. It has been seen observationally, so whether religion likes it or not, is that nobody can argue. Um, what, uh, what my personal preference is, well, like any theoretical physicist, I've been extremely intrigued by it. I, I tried my hand at it. I came up with some models. Is my model better than anyone else? It's absolutely not. And that's a problem. We are all really lost when it comes to that question. And, and it has become a game of models. It's uh, just trying to, to gain some intuition by building models and, and seeing what works and what doesn't. Now, when we started a decade ago, I mean, the, the first time we heard that energy is there was in 1998, the when, when, when we were new to this game, there was excitement that, you know, we'll try a few things and eventually we'll have the right answer, the right explanation. But by now, there are so many models out there that and none of them has really helped us gain any intuition. And observationally, it, it will take a huge, humongous investment. There, there have been many plans. And then, thanks to your economies, the economic crisis stopped all the funding in, in science experiments. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, there have been many experiments that, that were envisioned that would measure if we, we know that lambda is there, but we don't know whether it changes with time or whether it's a pure constant. So there were many experiments planned in the last decade that would go and measure that. Once we know how it changes with time, or, or if it's a constant, <coughs> then we know for sure what it is. If it's a constant, it's just a constant, then that's all. That's it, no more model building. But, but uh, all, yeah, all, all the funding for those experiments went because of the recession and all now. That right now, the only game in town is model building. Thank you. Thank so you so let's, much. Let's